Today, I'll be showing you how to set up a CO2 system on your aquarium. And along the way, I'll explain everything you need to know about CO2, including what all of these are. I'll also show you what to buy and more importantly, what not to waste your money on. If you are scared to add CO2 to your aquarium, don't be. I'll show you how easy it is. So first things first, why do you wanna add CO2 to your fish tank? Well, it makes growing plants so much easier. Outside of water, in nature, all of the trees, plants, and grass have sufficient CO2 in the air to grow and thrive. But underwater, there's not enough CO2 for plants to do excellent. And that is where these bad boys come in. It's CO2 in a bottle. It's really much easier for us as hobbyists to grow underwater plants with CO2. A CO2 system is a once-off expensive thing to set up but it's a very low cost thing to run in the long term. But before we talk about this, let's address the elephant in the room. And no, I am not talking about my wife. I am talking about liquid CO2. These products are vastly different from actual compressed CO2 in a bottle. Now liquid CO2 products does provide CO2, but it's actually less than 2% of what compressed CO2 like this does for your tank. Remember, CO2 is a gas. This is compressed gas inside of a bottle. This is not compressed gas. It's just a chemical that releases a teeny tiny bit of carbon. So not even remotely the same thing. So does this mean that liquid CO2 is a bad product? No. Liquid CO2 is actually a very good algae aside in small amounts, but in our experience, it should be used as a short-term plant boost or as a solution for algae control. And if you are really trying to find a source of CO2 for better plant growth, liquid CO2 is definitely not your long-term solution. It only provides a small amount of carbon, but it actually has a very tiny effect. Moving on to CO2 tablet. I'm not even gonna waste your time talking about these. They don't work. They cost a fortune in the long run and barely give you any CO2. So definitely not worth it. Before we move on to setting up a proper CO2 system on a tank, there's one more alternative that I would like to mention. DIY CO2 or small CO2 systems like these. Let's start with DIY CO2. You mix yeast and sugar or citric acid and bicarb and it creates a reaction and produces CO2. These systems really do work and produces a great amount of CO2, but for about 95% of people, it becomes expensive. It becomes an effort to control. It creates inconsistencies, which results in blackbeard algae. And it's just frustrating because it's a very hands-on experience. The main reason why we don't recommend DIY CO2 is because it produces inconsistent CO2. When you add the ingredients together in the beginning, it produces a lot of CO2. As the reaction slows down, it produces less and less CO2. You'll probably end up having to buy chemicals to control the algae. So I'll say it again, for most people, it's not worth the effort or money to try DIY CO2. Rather save your money and spend it on a proper CO2 system. But if you really can't afford to spend $200 or more on a proper CO2 setup, DIY CO2 might be an okay solution. But honestly, we don't recommend it due to the hands-on approach and the issues that comes with it. Alternatively, these smaller and cheaper starter CO2 setups are available, but once again, they don't work as well as a proper CO2 setup. And mostly, they give you more headaches in the long run than anything else. They don't dissolve the CO2 as well as a proper setup like this, and it doesn't work as well as you want it to work. Unless your tank is smaller than 10 liters, then it's not so bad. But if your tank is bigger than 10 liters, you'll definitely be wasting your time and your money. So if you don't have enough money for a proper CO2 setup, up. Rather save your money until you can afford a bigger system. And finally, we get to a proper CO2 setup. They are a lot easier, it creates less frustration, and your plants will thank you in the long run with some beautiful and lush growth. First up, we have the bottle. These bottles are usually made from steel or aluminium and houses your compressed CO2. You can find these at your local aquarium store. It should have the standard thread. If they don't have stock, check online stores. If that fails, go to Google and type in CO2 fire extinguisher. Make sure it's a CO2 fire extinguisher. All that you need to do is ask them to replace the pressure valve with a turn valve, because normally it comes with a pressure valve. But for aquariums, it's a lot safer to run a turn valve as you see here. The fire extinguisher place should be able to do the conversion for you. The price of these bottles in South Africa are between 1,300 to 3,000 Rand, and this should include the turn valve conversion. So now that we have the bottle, we need a way to regulate the CO2 that comes out of the bottle to make sure we add the right amount of CO2 to your aquarium. 
That is what a regulator does. Strideways is the sponsor of this video. They make extremely good quality regulators. They have the small form factor compact regulator like this one, and then they have the big boy regulator like this one. This one allows you to add a manifold to it. This will enable you to run more than one aquascape from one single bottle. But to understand how good these regulators are, we first need to take a step back and look at entry level regulators. There is a large number of different regulators in the market. Let me give you a quick rundown. This is the normal cheap regulator. It limits the amount of CO2 from your bottle to your aquarium. And this is the cheapest regulator available. Next to that, we have a regulator with a solenoid. This little black box is the solenoid and makes your life so much easier. Remember, you don't want CO2 in your aquarium to run for 24 hours because that comes with its own set of issues. You only need the CO2 on your tank when the lights are on. That is when the plants use the CO2. When the lights are off, the CO2 can stop. So this solenoid connects to a timer. This makes your life as an aquarist so much easier. If you compare these regulators with this regulator, this one you have to switch on manually every single day by turning this dial. What the solenoid does with the timer, you set it up once and you forget it until you run out of gas. So do yourself a favor and get a regulator with a solenoid. It's much easier. And if you can, get a higher quality regulator like the Strideways ones. You get a three year warranty with it and it's made with much higher quality parts. When you research regulators, you will find that there's a dual stage regulator as well as a dual gauge regulator. Don't get confused or trapped in that robot hole. If I have to speak about the differences in dual stage versus dual gauge regulators, it will be a 20 minute video in itself. I'll leave that for another day. That being said, with today's technology, there is nothing wrong with only having one gauge or a single stage regulator, especially if you go for the higher end products like the Strideways. So let's summarize from the cheapest to the most expensive. This regulates the CO2 and requires manual intervention. All of the other regulators have got a built-in solenoid. All that you do is you hook it up to a timer and you are good to go. And now we can move on to bubble counters. You need to know how much CO2 is going in your aquarium and that is where a bubble counter really helps. You'll fill up this section with water or glycerin and as the gas passes through, it will make bubbles that you are able to count. You can use this as a guide or an estimation of how many bubbles to start off with your specific size aquarium. If you don't have a regulator with a built-in bubble counter, you can get one of these fancy spiral bubble counters that will intrigue anyone looking at your aquarium. Or you can just get a simple one like this. This brings us to CO2 tubing. The tubing is used to get the CO2 from the regulator into the water. You can use regular silicone or PVC tubing, but silicone or PVC is not CO2 resistant. That means over time it will break, crack or get tiny holes as it erodes the CO2. That is why we use CO2 resistant tubing. This tube is made from polyurethane, and the CO2 won't affect it. It is slightly more expensive, but it is recommended to get the right CO2 tubing to avoid having issues down the line with CO2 leaks. Along the tube, you can add a non-return valve. All that this does is it makes sure that the water does not run back from your aquarium into your regulator. Now with the higher end regulators, the non-return valve is not necessary as this section already has a built-in bubble counter. A lot of people actually don't know that this section already has a bubble counter built into it, but it actually makes sense when you think about it because there's water inside of the bubble counter. How does this water not run back into the regulator? Well, the simple answer is there's a non-return valve in this section. Don't use these cheap ones meant for air. They really don't work after a few months. Rather buy a proper one meant to deal with CO2 and high pressure. And then lastly, let's talk about the diffusers. All that the diffuser does is it makes the bubbles very fine. You want the mist as fine as possible. Bigger bubbles travel a lot quicker to the top. The slower the bubbles rise, the more time the CO2 has to dissolve in your water before it reaches the top. From our experience, the diffusers with the brown discs works the best to create a fine mist bubble effect. White discs still work, they're just not as efficient in our experience. It is also recommended that the flow of the water somehow disrupts the flow of these bubbles going to the top. This means that if the bubbles don't go straight up, they spend more time in your aquarium and dissolve a bit better. This also brings us to inline diffusers or inline reactors. An inline diffuser is added in your outflow pipe of your canister filter or sump. 
This helps in getting the equipment out of your aquascape, but in our experience they don't work as well as running the CO2 directly into your tank, so we don't recommend that you use them. They do however work better for a shallow tank. In a shallow tank there is not enough space for the bubbles to dissolve before they reach the top. Inline diffusers works much better for shallow aquariums. Now that you understand everything, let's put a CO2 system together. We will start with the bottle. Today we'll be using a standard 2kg bottle with a very good strideways regulator. We'll also use an ADA CO2 resistant tubing, ESTA non-return valve and a twin star diffuser. We're going to start with your regulator. First thing you need to do is adjust the middle dial to about halfway. Then you'll take your regulator, first make sure it has a seal on this section and then you'll attach it to the bottle. Once you've attached it, you'll hand tighten it until you can't adjust it anymore. Once that is done, you'll take your spanner. This spanner is usually included with the regulator. Do half a turn while keeping the dials pointing up. Next up is the bubble counter. You'll proceed opening this section at the top. Be careful that the seal in this section does not fall out. And then you'll take a syringe with either water or glycerine. You can then fill it up between 3 quarters and all the way full. And now when the CO2 passes through, you'll be able to count the bubbles. Make sure the seal is in the right position and proceed to close the bubble counter again. You'll open up the far top section. Take your CO2 tubing, push this section you took off over the CO2 tubing. You can now push the CO2 tubing over the nipple and then fasten it by attaching this section that you took off. Next, you'll take the rest of your tubing and run it into your tank. Next, you take your U-bend and attach it along the pipe making sure you leave enough CO2 tubing for the inside of your aquarium. You will cut your tube and attach it to your U-bend. This will make a nice clean round look for your CO2 tubing. Next, you'll take your diffuser. When you take out your diffuser, you'll most likely also see a suction cup. You can attach it to your diffuser. It is important to remember that when you attach your diffuser to your tubing, you should not hold it here because that part is very fragile. Rather hold it like this. If you hold it here, it will break. So it's much safer to hold it here. I cut the tube a bit long. We need to calculate the distance. I calculate it to about here. Cut it and reattach the diffuser. Now you take your non-return valve. The non-return valve usually has a section with an arrow. That arrow is the direction of the actual CO2 flow. Take your tubing and cut it anywhere between the bubble counter and the diffuser. Make sure the arrow is in the correct position and attach it to your tubing. You can cut it anywhere along the tubing all the way to the top. Next you're going to position your diffuser. The important thing is to keep in mind the flow of the water. Your flow should be coming from the opposite side of the diffuser so that when the CO2 bubbles rise, they will be distributed throughout the tank as the water flows. If you position the flow over here, it is not strong enough to pull the CO2 bubbles all the way over there. Just make sure your working pressure is set to the middle and then you open your bottle. Once you open the bottle, you'll notice that the gauges on your regulator showing the pressure levels. Next, you'll plug in your regulator. Usually you want to plug it into your timer, but for this demonstration I'll plug it into the wall. You should hear a tick sound once you plug it in. That tick sound is from the solenoid opening. You can see here that the CO2 is running already. You might need to adjust your needle valve first to start seeing bubbles. Now we just adjust this needle valve until you are able to count your bubbles. It will take a few minutes for the CO2 to run through the tubing, so don't worry if you don't see bubbles immediately. Also, the bubbles in the bubble counter will slow down as the pressure equalizes in the system, so it might need some fine tuning a few minutes later. Other than that, you're good to go. The last thing you can do if you want to add multiple CO2 outputs to your system, you can add a strideways manifold. And then you can just follow the same principles. And that's it for this video. If this video sucked, you know what to do, but if it was awesome, get subscribed, press that like button and check out our other videos. I hope you guys learned something today and as always, keep it simple.